Hi everyone, welcome to another week of Sunday Online uh, from here at Frinton Free Church. Um, I'm Mark and this is Sally and Sally's back. Hooray! Hooray, you're back. It's great to see you. Thank you. It's we great have to you. be back. It really is. It feels, <laughs> it feels like a very long time but I'm really pleased to be back. Um, and we're going to start with some verses that um, some of us will have read this week as we've been continuing through Romans. Uh, and it's just from the very end of chapter 11. Oh, the depths of the riches of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable his judgments and his paths beyond tracing out. Who has known the mind of the Lord or who has been his counsellor? Who has ever given to God that God should repay them? For from him and through him and for him are all things. To him be the glory forever. And Father, we want to praise you and thank you that this is true of you, that it has always been true and that it always will be true. And Father, as we gather to worship you now, uh, in our different places and different situations, Lord, we want to say uh, that all things are from you and through you and for you. And Lord, we want to give you the glory. We praise you and we worship you, Lord of Lords, King of Kings, God of Gods. And we praise you too that you choose to come near to us as we come near to you. And we thank you, Lord, for this opportunity to spend some time together in your presence now. Be lifted up, we pray, in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Let's worship our King. Come, let us bow at his feet. He has some grace. What the Savior has done See how his love overcomes He has done great things He has done great things Oh hero of heaven You conquered the grave You free every captive And break every chain Oh God have done great things we dance in your freedom awake and alive oh jesus our savior your name lifted high oh god you have done great things you've been faithful through every storm Yeah. 
active and break every chain Oh God, you have done great things We dance in your freedom So as always, there's a couple of things that we just want to draw your attention to. And, uh, you know, here at The Free, uh, we, our, our mission, the reason our church exists is to make every moment count, to see lives transformed by Jesus. And we, we do that in lots of different ways. And one of the ways, perhaps one of our biggest ways that we're doing that is through um, Oasis Community Cafe. Mm. And uh, I'm sure many of you have dropped in, but I just wanted to draw your attention to it because if you haven't done, drop in uh, to Oasis during the week. It's open most mornings of the week and you can drop in and have a cup of tea, a cup of coffee, some conversation. There's a rhythm of prayer that exists uh, within that as well. It's a really great space to, to make friends. And uh, it also runs an art gallery, uh, mm -hmm. which is incredible. Uh, Simon Carter, one of our members, uh, who's an artist himself, uh, invites different artists to show their work in there. And every month, every six weeks or so, uh, the art changes. There's some amazing stuff in there, mm. and it's just a celebration of the gifts that God has given people, and it's given us the opportunity just to really uh, connect with the art community in our area. So do drop in and uh, and have a cup of tea, cup of coffee, and have a look at some of the art. It's um it's exceptional. It really is. Yeah, and of course the other key thing that takes place in Oasis, along with other many other things during the week, is on a Sunday afternoon uh, our cafe church meets there. Uh, again, Simon Carter is involved in heading that up and uh, we gather together at 5.30 every Sunday for some fellowship, for some worship, uh, just to uh, spend time uh, with each other and with God. So again, if, you, if you're in the area and you've never been to one of our cafe church gatherings, then do consider doing that. It's a really special time uh, of being together and uh, another way that we can worship as a community together. Absolutely. And uh, just the other thing uh, that I'm sure I don't need to draw your attention to because we can't move for it um, on the news at the moment is the general election is coming up, of course, on the 4th of July. And, uh, you know, as a church, we're going to be thinking and praying about that over the next few weeks. And I uh, just wanted to kind of draw our attention to the fact that as disciples of Jesus, uh, that's something that we want to be involved in. And, you know, God wants his church to be involved uh, in that political arena in different ways and to be praying and, and writing to MPs and also thinking about the importance of our vote. And so one of the things we just wanted to flag up is if you haven't registered to vote, uh, you need to do that. And uh, you know, so many people, I think, I think last year, or the last few elections, there's been a number of people have turned up to vote and haven't been able to because mm. uh, they haven't registered. So if you haven't registered, registered to vote. Uh, you can do that online if you just search for that. Uh, uh, how do I register to vote? It will take you through the form and you can vote, you can register to vote so that you can actually make your vote count on the day itself. And of course the other thing uh, that to encourage everyone to do is actually to go to vote uh, and of course most people will do that in person but you can uh, have a postal vote or you can vote by proxy uh, but it's so important that we use that that democratic right that we've been given in this country uh, to express uh, our support for whatever party we feel led mm. to vote for. So, and don't forget when you do uh, go actually to the polling station, now you do need to take a photographic ID. Um, so that a lot of people again last year mm. fell through the gap because they didn't do that. So just a reminder, a, a sort of strong encouragement really from us to, uh, to make sure that you do go on the day and that you take some ID with you. We're going to take some time now to pray. Uh, this prayer was produced by the Evangelical Alliance in the run-up to the general election. So let's just uh, commit it to prayer now. Father God, maker of all things, King of heaven, ruler beyond and within time and space, we pray for the United Kingdom ahead of the general election. 
for women and men of integrity to be selected and to stand across the political divides. We pray protection over their health and families and perseverance amid the pressures of social media and the weight of scrutiny. May we see a change in the landscape, more examples of character over charisma, humility over hubris, sacrifice over selfishness. Restore trust, uphold truth and repair the cracked foundations we can see across civic society and public life. Lift the voices and the standing of the vulnerable, those who are poor, the forgotten and those who are in despair. Guard us against the twin temptations to either see politics as our salvation or to consider it of no concern whatsoever. Neither above us nor below us, help us to be present at the crux of the conversation, at the dinner table, school gates and staff rooms. Help us to speak and act distinctively as those full of your love, grace and truth, in person and online. We give you thanks for all that you have made. Help us to steward well. Education, health, social welfare, agriculture, immigration, the economy, policing and security, the arts, foreign policy and aid. Raise up followers of you in every sphere. Mm. Public leaders who love you and their neighbours. Grant us wisdom and discernment, perspective and grace. Remind us of our calling to be ambassadors of Jesus, active and engaged in these days, but deeply rooted in the hope of your kingdom to come. Gift us opportunities to share your good news for everyone in every sphere of life through your son, Jesus Christ, on earth as it is in heaven. Amen. Amen.
Turn your eyes upon Jesus Look full in His wonderful face And the things of earth will grow strangely dim In the light of His glory and grace Where justice and mercy embrace There the Son of God gave His life for us And our measureless debt was erased Jesus, to You we lift our eyes Let us pray. Lord, we are grateful to be gathered together today to worship your holy name. We offer our worship and adoration to you, for you are worthy to be praised. We lift our voices together to offer you all that you are due. Thank you for bringing us together today to worship in this place. 
Father God, in Jesus, your Son, you've made yourself known to those who are near and those who are far off. We give you praise that no one is beyond reach of your love and that your desire is that everyone be drawn to your light. We give you thanks that your light shines in all places and towards all people and that your light has shone in our hearts. Help us this day to walk in the light of your Spirit as we seek to live for your glory. Lord, when we are weary, give us fresh energy. And when we're sleepy, give us rest. When we're frustrated, give us calmness. When we're sad, give us comfort. When we're disappointed, give us hope. When we're happy, rejoice with us. When we're hopeful, give us courage to share. In everything, you turn us back to focus on you. Lord Jesus, you call us to take up our cross and follow. When we forfeit our soul to gain the whole world, Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. When we're distracted from prayer and watchfulness, Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. When we're unfaithful to the gospel through denial, betrayal or aggression, Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. When we shrink from the implications of love, Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Merciful God, pardon our sin and renew in us all of God's people and desire to follow Christ's way. Amen. So we're continuing our journey through the New Testament and a bit later Mark is going to be speaking from the book of Romans. Uh, so I'm going to read chapter 12, the first eight verses. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing and perfect will. For by the grace given me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance with the faith God has distributed to each of you. For just as each of us has one body with many members, and these members do not all have the same function, so in Christ we, though many, form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. We have different gifts, according to the grace given to each of us. If your gift is prophesying, then prophesy in accordance with your faith. If it is serving, then serve. If it is teaching, then teach. If it is to encourage, then give encouragement. If it is giving, then give generously. If it is to lead, do it diligently. If it is to show mercy, do it cheerfully. So we are now in the book of Romans and Sally just read us this great passage from Romans chapter 12 and uh, if you haven't got your Bibles there with you I encourage you just to have this passage in front of you and uh, it's really famous I think these few verses I'm sure if you're watching here today you, you would have heard this um, in different ways you would have read it and uh, it this passage begins with this word, therefore, therefore, in view of God's mercies, etc. And in writing this, Paul is kind of encouraging us to look back on everything he's written so far in the book of Romans. And he's saying, all that is therefore these reasons. And he's asking us to look at this incredible picture that he's painted, the good news of the gospel of Jesus that we've heard all the way through the book of Romans. And he now moves on to this sort of new section. Therefore, if you like, how do we apply all those truths? How do we apply the good news of Jesus to our lives as disciples? And in this little section, there's so much that is there. He talks about offering our bodies as living sacrifices. He talks about being transformed by the renewing of our minds. And this 
implication, therefore, to go and serve as well, to go and make a difference in the body of Christ. There is so much here. In fact, I was, I was just reading this week as I was preparing that uh, Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones, who famously led Westminster Chapel in London for many years, a famous uh, preacher, he, he managed to preach 10 sermons on the first two verses of Romans chapter 12 alone. It is so dense. There is so much there for us. We can't possibly uh, go into all of it. I'm not going to, don't worry, I'm not going to preach 10 sermons uh, now uh, on these few verses. But it is an amazing chapter. It is a standout kind of chapter, in, perhaps in the whole of Scripture. But there are three things uh, that we're going to work our way through um, over the next few minutes. Uh, as we look at these eight verses. We're going to look at what it means for us as disciples of Jesus to be a living sacrifice. What is Paul really getting at in those verses? We're going to think a little bit about what it means to be a servant. If we're disciples of Jesus, then we are called to serve. And then we're going to think about, well, why would we do that? Why, Why on earth would we live as living sacrifices? Why on earth would we choose to serve other people? What is the reason for that? So the first thing we're going to think about is this, is that as a disciple of Jesus, I am a living sacrifice. Paul makes that absolutely clear. He says this, doesn't he? I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices. He's urging us. In, in fact, in the, in the original Greek, this phrase, living sacrifice, is literally make your life a living killing. A living killing. And it's, it's kind of an oxymoron, isn't it? You can't, something can't be a living sacrifice. A sacrifice is dead. And so it can't be alive at the same time. You can't have a living killing. So what is he getting at? What does he mean by this? Well, we need to remind ourselves a little bit about worship in the Old Testament and what it meant to worship God. You see, for Jews, Old Testament worship was pretty bloody. It meant going, if you were worshipping, it meant going to the temple and taking an animal, a sheep, a goat, uh, birds, doves, the, 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 the most special, the unmarked animal, and taking it and offering it as an animal sacrifice, as a sacrifice to God. It would have been killed, it would have been offered to God, and everything all the totality of that animal would have been offered to God. The blood and the, the bones would have been burnt and the flesh would have been burnt. And so Paul's using this phrase, offer your bodies as a living sacrifice to God. And so for those hearing and reading this, as Paul sent this letter to the church in Rome, they would have been taken back to the temple and their worship. And Paul is saying to them that to be a disciple of Jesus is both like and unlike Old Testament worship and sacrifices. If we take why it is unlike it, first of all, you know, Old Testament sacrifices were really bloody. It was the atoning for sin that was taking part. There was a punishment that was being involved for the sin that that person had engaged with. And yeah, this is literally where we get the, the phrase scapegoat from. That, you know, if you took an animal uh, to worship at the temple, it's like your sins were transferred onto that animal. And there was a particular time in the year where a goat was used and the sin of the people was put onto the goat. They were guilt offerings and they were given so that people could get right with God so we could earn our forgiveness with God. If I give the sacrifice, then God forgive me. But it's not the same, Paul is saying, for us today. Because of what Jesus has done, Jesus' sacrifice was for once and for all. We don't need to go on giving those sacrifices anymore. So being a living sacrifice is unlike Old Testament worship. Instead, we offer our lives for worship and praise. We're not earning God's favour. We're offering ourselves out of worship. It's our true and proper worship to God. We're not trying to earn his forgiveness. Jesus has done that. It's also not the same for us as once you offered an animal sacrifice to God, it was all done with. It was, it, you know, that, that was, it was for that moment and it was, it was done until the next time that you went to offer that sacrifice. 
But it's different here. Paul is talking about a living sacrifice. And so a living sacrifice is never done. It is ongoing. We're always offering ourselves to God 24-7, deliberately and consciously offering ourselves to God every moment of the day. It is never done. It's not just about turning up to church when we do this. It's not just about going to the temple once every now and again. It's an ongoing piece of worship. It's an ongoing life of worship. But Paul does say, offer yourselves as living sacrifices. So there are some similarities to that Old Testament worship. And that's because what's similar between what we do today and what was done in the Old Testament is that something is being put to death. A sacrifice is taking place. What's being put to death when we offer ourselves as living sacrifices is the idea that I can do whatever I want when I want. What I'm putting to death when I offer myself as a living sacrifice is the idea that I am in charge of my life. That I know best. That my feelings and my desires are always okay and to be followed. That I can live how I want and how I choose. And that feels like a death. The idea, Paul is saying here, that we take our hands off our lives and instead we offer our life to God. I give up my control. And that feels like a death. Because it's hard. It's hard. And I'm sure some of you watching this will know exactly what I'm talking about. There are things in your life, there are moments where you've given up what you would want and what you would desire so that you can worship God with your whole life. That moment where we turn to God and we say, you know best, I give myself to you, not what I want, but what you want. It's the idea of dying to self so that Jesus can live within us. In fact, Jesus himself says this, doesn't he, time and time again to his disciples, to those people who are following. He says, you know, whoever wants to gain life must give up their life. If you want to follow me, you must pick up your cross every day and follow me. Whoever wants to try and hold on to their life, he says, will lose it. But whoever wants to gain life must give it up for me. It's hands off. It's total surrender to Jesus that's the picture that Paul is painting here and that feels like a death but it's a death that leads to life you know do you remember a few weeks ago uh, when we were in Mark's gospel we were we were looking at this and we were looking at how Jesus calls us he says take the narrow path he says take this take the small gate and lead And take the narrow path if you want to follow me. And we said that that narrow path looks like a death. It looks like it's going to be difficult. But actually it it leads to life. Paul's talking about exactly the same thing here. He's saying be a living sacrifice. Sacrifice your life. And know that that's a decision that actually leads to life. He writes this later on to the uh, church in Galatians. Uh, He says this, he says, I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. In other words, I am a living sacrifice. It's no longer I that live, but it's Christ that lives in me. It's a death, he says, that leads to life. And this is what it means to be a disciple of Christ. Jesus, a living sacrifice, hands off, giving everything to King Jesus, holding nothing back from him. I was reading this week about a a young American woman in the 1930s who became a Christian. And and when she became a disciple of Jesus, in that moment, she realised she needed to take her hands off her life. And so she started to worship God with everything. And back in the 1930s, she felt this nudge to become a missionary. 
and to become a missionary to Asia. Now, you know, if we, we have to think back a little bit, but for a, a single woman at that time to become a missionary was a huge sacrifice. It wasn't the normal done thing. And for a single woman to become a missionary in Asia was huge with all the political pressure and the danger of that at the time. But she went and she did it. It's just an incredible sort of thought, absolute total surrender, taking her hands off her life, being a living sacrifice. I'm going to give up a comfortable life in America to go and serve Jesus in Asia. And she was asked, she was asked, well, why would you do that? What would make you want to do that? And she said this, she said, I totally surrendered to God because I knew he was infinitely wise and infinitely loving. What an incredible thought that is. She said, God was infinitely wise, or is infinitely wise, and he's infinitely loving. She said, that's why I can take my hands off my life. That's why I can be a living sacrifice for him. And it's the same for you and me, isn't it? We we surrender, we take our hands off our lives because God is infinitely wise he knows what's best he knows what's best for you and for me sometimes let's be honest we think we know best (laughs) and we think well actually God yeah I hear what you're saying but I think this is better for me to live my life in this way and that way I think it's better that I use my money in this way God I think it's better that I'm in this relationship with this person God I think it's better that I hold that unforgiveness against that person because they've really hurt me etc 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 and we think we're wise We're not. God is infinitely wise. If he's God, then he's wiser than you and he's wiser than me. And so when he asks us to do something, when he asks us to take our hands off our lives and to live as living sacrifices, he knows best, even when it looks that we might know best. He is infinitely wise and he's infinitely loving as well. And so when he says, take your hands off your life, be a living sacrifice, it's always motivated by his love for you and for me it's always for our best always for our best because he loves us and he loves us and he loves us you know when we get to a place where we can say that God is infinitely wise and when we can say yeah I believe he's infinitely wise and he's infinitely loving towards me Then we take our hands off our lives and that is where real freedom is. That is where life is. When our lives are totally given over to Jesus in this way. See, the alternative is that we say, well, okay, God, I will obey you and I will follow you if dot, 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 if you do this. Or if that happens in my life. And whatever's on the other side of that if is really what we're serving. You know, I will follow you, God, if I make this sort of money and if I'm comfortable. I will follow you, God, if I can always live here. I will follow you, God, if you don't ask me to give this up or that up. Whatever's on the other side of that if is really who we're serving and really what has control over our life. When our hands are fully off, then there is freedom for us. Because we're all sacrificing and we're all serving something. It's either God or it's something else. Don't buy into the lie that you're totally free and that you're totally kind of making your own decisions. Some of us are thinking, you know, well, that doesn't sound like freedom to me, Mark. You know, living my life in that way, being controlled by God and giving my life over to him. I want to be free. Don't buy into that lie because we're all giving ourselves and we're all living for something else or somebody else. Maybe that's your career, And you're totally invested and totally sold out for your career. Well, if that's the case, it will eventually drive you into the ground as you give too much, more and more and more to your career. 
Maybe it's one person and you think, well, I'll follow you, God, but as long as I can be with this person, as long as it doesn't upset them, I'll obey you, God. But if you're living your life for a person, well, what happens when they're not here? Well, what happens when they reject you? Maybe it's about financial security and, and that's the thing that's driving you. And you know, as long as I'm secure one day and I've got my house and I've got my pension, I've got enough money in the bank account. Well, if you're living a your life for that, that's precarious. That money can go at any minute. Or maybe you're thinking, well, actually, Mark, I'm not serving my job and I'm not serving another person. It's just about me. I just want to be free for me. Well, then you're, you're, you're an idol to yourself. And what a pressure that is to weigh on your shoulders. You're going to have to serve someone or something. And God is the only one who is infinitely wise and infinitely loving. If you're going to give your life to something, if you're going to sacrifice your life to someone, sacrifice it to the one who is infinitely wise, who knows best, who sees the beginning from the end, and sacrifice to someone who's totally loving for you. Everything else, everyone else will take from you. Take your hands off, Paul says. He says, I urge you, I urge you to give your life as a living sacrifice. That's what a disciple of Jesus does. Paul goes on to write that the outworking of this is that a disciple of Jesus is a servant, is a servant to others, a living sacrifice. As we give our lives over, if we take our hands off our lives, means serving others. And he writes this, doesn't he? In verses four to eight, he starts to outline that as to what it looks like. And he says, you know, we're, we're one body, many parts. He, he uses it several times in the New Testament as how the body of Christ works. That we're there to serve. We've all got a different role to play, just as different parts of our body have an important role to play. So do each of us in the body of Christ. And he says, you know, these are the different things that we can do. Here's how we can serve. We can prophesy. We can serve. We can teach. We can encourage. We can give. We can lead others. We can care for the poor and show mercy to others. And it's not exhaustive. He's just giving some ideas. There are so many things that we can do. You are gifted, it says. And there are two things uh, that, we can, that we can see in this. Is that Paul says, to each of us. That means there's gifts for all of us. If you're watching this today, if you're listening to this today, you are gifted. Congratulations. You've got gifts that God has given you. Because each of us has them. The other point that we need to look at is that there are different gifts as well. Not only are you gifted, but you're unique in the gifts, in the certain mix of gifts that God has given you. Nobody is like you. And the good news is there's only one of me. That's enough for anyone, isn't it? Only one mark. And the gifts that I've given were not all the same. And this means that we all then get to play. If all of us have got gifts... And we've all got different gifts, then we all get to play. We all get to take part in God's kingdom. No one is unemployed. Nobody is retired in God's kingdom. There is always something. There is always a role for you and I to play. We can all look to serve. We can all look to give of ourselves in Jesus' kingdom. That's what it means to take our hands off our lives and to live as living sacrifices. But that also means that none of us get to be part of a church and Jesus' family and think, well, what can I get out of this? That's not why we're part of Jesus' family. That's not why we're part of his church. It's not what we get out of it. Instead, we need to be part of Jesus' family saying, what can I contribute What is the role that God has got for me? How can I use my unique gifts in this family, in the kingdom of God? That's what living sacrifice looks like. Being able to give, being able to contribute. You see, actually, when we take our hands off our lives, 
And we open them. Suddenly we're open-handed. We're able to give of ourselves. What are you contributing? What am I contributing? How am I giving as part of this? If we should truly live as living sacrifices, we need to be contributing. We need to be giving. You know, right now, I know that within our church family, uh, the, the children's team, for example, could do with some volunteers. I know, for example, the, the creche. We run a creche on a Sunday for the preschools kids. And I know there needs to be some extra people helping out in that group. Maybe you can contribute in that way. I know the youth team could do with some, some more volunteers to volunteer on a Sunday or in the midweek activities so that more young people, more teenagers can come to know the good news of Jesus. And there's other places as well. If you're not contributing, have a think. How could you come and serve? How could you be part of being part of the body of Christ and giving your gifts in that way? Because there are things that only you can do. We've all got different gifts. There's only, there are some people that only you can reach with the good news of Jesus. I can't do it, but you could do it. Get in touch, have a chat. I'd love to talk to you about that. As a disciple of Jesus, we're servants. Paul says, we're here to serve, we're here to give. So we're called to live as living sacrifices. We're called to be servants. But why would we do that? Why would we choose this way of life? And lots of people live generous lives, don't we? Don't they? Uh, it's not just Christians who take their hands off their lives. And I suspect you all know people who aren't disciples of Jesus, but are generous that are serving the community in different ways. Some people do that for moral reasons. They think, well, that's the right thing to do. I'm not just here for myself. Some people are just particularly community-minded, aren't they? And they think, yeah, if I'm going to be part of a community, this is what it looks like. Some people do it for very religious reasons. And it's almost like, well, I will please God if I serve. God will love me more if I serve or Maybe the alternative is if I don't do this, God won't love me. God won't look favourably on me. So there's a religious reason for that, but a little bit twisted, maybe. But as disciples of Jesus, we have other reasons for living as living sacrifices. We have other reasons for serving. We have a better reason, the best reason. And Paul outlines it here in this chapter, and it's right in the first verse. He says this, he says, Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, and here's the reason, in view of God's mercy. We choose this way of life in view of God's mercy. We've caught a glimpse of all that God has done for us. And because of that, because of his love, because of his grace, because of all the good things he's poured into our lives. We therefore live as living sacrifices. We therefore choose to serve others. And I love this. It's so different, isn't it? Paul urges us. It's not a command. He could have written a command. He could have written, therefore, brothers, says, I command you in view of God's mercy. It's not a command. It's an urge. It's a kind of, why wouldn't you? Why wouldn't you? It's an offer. It's an invitation from him. I urge you in view of God's mercy. This sets us apart. This is the unique thing of being a disciple of Jesus. We're not commanded to serve. We're not commanded to offer ourselves to God. We do it because we caught a glimpse of his mercies because of how good he is to you and to me. And so we take our hands off our lives and we offer them to God. Martin Lloyd-Jones, who wrote those 10 sermons on verses 1 and 2 of Romans chapter 12, in, in one of those sermons, he tells a story about walking in one of the parks in London and uh, seeing a man walking his kind of little dog and the dog's on a lead and who's walking there. And at one point, the, the owner of the dog, this man, decides to take the dog off the lead. And uh, 
Much the same if I took my dog off the lead, this dog then just runs and disappears and is a dot in the distance on the other side of the park and it's gone and before long the man can't see his dog, can just about hear it yapping in the distance, but it is gone. And the man starts to panic, starts to look for his dog, starts to run, starts to head in the direction of where the dog is. But not long after, the dog runs back to the man and appears at his side and starts to walk alongside the man. And in fact, the man never needs to put the lead back on his dog Because from that walk onwards, every time the man takes his dog out, the dog trots alongside him. The dog has offered itself to his owner. He still has an owner, he still has a master, but has taken his paws off his life, if you like. He's taken his hands off, says, I'm offering myself to you as my master because I know this is the very best place for me to be. He's offering himself never needs to go back on the lead. And that's the same for you and for me, isn't it? We offer ourselves to God. We still have a master. We still have him as our king, as our rabbi, as our teacher, as our saviour. But we offer ourselves in view of how good and how merciful God has been to you. Can you see all that he's done for you? Do you understand all that God has done for you? I love this earlier on in Romans chapter 8. Maybe you noticed it as we were reading this. Paul writes this, He who did not spare his own son, that's Jesus, but gave him up for all of us, how will he not also along with him graciously give us all things? That's how good God has been. That is the mercy that God has given you. He's given you Jesus. He's given me Jesus. He's offered that which was most precious to him, his one and only son. And so also along with him, he graciously and gladly gives us all things. When we get a glimpse of that, when we get a view of God's mercies, What else can we do other than offer ourselves back to him, to take our hands off our lives and give our lives back to him, just as Jesus did? Jesus is the ultimate example of voluntary submission. Jesus is the ultimate example of someone who took his hands off his life and gave it to Father God. In fact, John 10, Jesus says that. He says, nobody takes my life. Nobody takes my life from me. I lay it down of my own accord. I offer myself. Why did Jesus do that? Why did Jesus offer his life on the cross out of sheer love for you and for me? So take your hands off your life. I've got to take my hands off my life. Jesus has done that for you. Jesus has done that for me. Who am I to keep hold of my life? Who am I to keep my hands on my life? Jesus takes his hands off his life and became a dying sacrifice. We take our hands off of our lives and we become a living sacrifice. As he pours his life and his spirit into us and this newness of life as we take our hands off our life this newness of life that Jesus pours into us is what I've always been looking for is what you've always been looking for it looks like a death but it leads to life and he is infinitely wise and he is infinitely loving it's the very best thing you and I can do the cross shows us that brothers and sisters in view of God's mercy I urge you I urge you to lay your life down as a living sacrifice to Jesus let's take some time to respond let's take some time to pray we're going to use this 
piece of music, use this worship song to help us to do that. And then I'm going to come back and we're going to, we're going to take some time just to pray together. Let's pray, shall we? And maybe as you're watching this and there's, wherever you are, let's just close our eyes. Let's open our hands, almost as a sign to God that we're taking our hands off our lives. And maybe there's something in particular that we've looked at this morning that God has put his hand on, that he's put his finger on. That struck a chord with you. And Holy Spirit, we invite you to come and work in our lives now. Where you've challenged us and this is a challenge. We ask Holy Spirit, you'll come and work deep within us. Help us, Holy Spirit, to live in this way. Help us to take our hands off our lives. And maybe you know right now, as we've been looking at this, there's a particular area of your life that you're holding on to. That almost you've said to Jesus, you can, you can have everything apart from that. I want control over that area. Maybe Jesus is saying to you this morning, take your hands off. If you want to know what life really is, take your hands off that area. Just begin to pray that through with Father God now. We choose to offer ourselves as living sacrifices, the totality of who we are, Jesus. The very fullness of who we are. And Jesus, the challenge for some of us there is to step into servant servant lifestyle, to serve you in your kingdom. And Father, if that's us, if we're if we're not contributing, if we're not playing our part, if we're not using our gifts, would you begin to show us how we can do that in the in the body of your church? And as we do that. As we take our hands off, help us to step into the newness of life that you have for us, Jesus. That we can truly say it's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. What a place to be, to say Jesus fully is alive in me. Help us to step into the newness of that. To know that this death we experience as we give our lives to you leads to life. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So thank you. Thank you for tuning in. Thank you for listening and for working this through. I know it's a huge challenge, that, but it's, it's an invitation as well that we're given. So do step into that. If we can be praying for you in any way, if you'd like to talk any of this through, do as always uh, get in touch with us here at The Free. Sally and myself Always love hearing from you. Always love to know what Jesus is doing in your life. So thank you for tuning in. Next week um, at Sunday Online, uh, we've got a friend of our church, Jerry Brown, who uh, is pastor at Colchester Road uh, Church in Ipswich, is going to be preaching. He's going to be here on the Sunday, uh, but he's also going to be recording a talk for us as well. So do tune in uh, to hear Jerry as he continues our journey through the New Testament. God bless you, Uh, we're cheering you on and we are praying for you.